I am super, super excited to be here today with Amiko from Amiko Rainbow. I have been, I have known Amiko over Instagram for so, so long, and I can't believe this is the first time we're actually looking at each other face to face and chatting because Amiko has been one of my uh, go-to freelance sources because me and her have been in the service pattern freelance struggle for a while. <laughs> Not necessarily a struggle, but we've been doing it together. And um, her background is um, working in-house designing holiday decor. And now she does freelance for products, licenses her artwork. She sells it directly as prints in her shop. Oh my goodness, she has so much going on. So um, I am super excited to dig into things today with you, Amiko. Hi, thanks for having me. Welcome. So awesome. <laughs> um, so first off, can you give folks a summary of how you got started working, creating art for products? Um, well, I went to the Minneapolis College of Art and Design uh, here in Minnesota. I graduated in 2009. Um, I have a BFA in illustration, and in the illustration program, there was a product design class that I took with my favorite teacher ever, Lindsay Knoll. Uh, she is a freelance artist as well in Minneapolis. She's a tattoo artist. She owned a gallery. She's like Jack of all trades, super cool lady. Um, she came up to me one time in class and said that she knew someone at Department 56 which is a local Christmas holiday company here, um, they were hiring an intern and that I should apply. And at the time I was like, what, me? No, like imposter syndrome. Like they want like this meek little college student to do it, but um, I did it. I, I applied uh, along with this other girl and, and I got it. And so I had an internship slash kind of part-time job locked in even before I graduated, which was amazing and kind of a relief because mm. 2008, 2009, we know what was happening. It was the big recession and super scary. Um, and also having an art degree on top of it, you're like, am I ever gonna <laughs> make money in my life? <laughs> Probably not, I don't know. But knowing the reputation of Department 56, you know, they have the Christmas villages, they have snow babies. They have all their decor. Um, it, it it's a it's a well known name, and I was like super proud and super excited to have a have something locked in. Um, I worked there for about a year, and I literally started from the ground up, opening like dirty boxes that traveled <laughs> all around the world with like yellow wrapping, like bubble wrap, and I would be dirty and full of glitter, and mm. I'd have to like unwrap all these boxes and they would be these like beautiful glass mermaid ornaments inside oh coming goodness. from overseas. And I would just be like, oh my gosh, like someone made this here where I'm at. And this is what comes of it. And then I would um, organize the showrooms and get the showrooms ready for the art director and the design team. So they would do sample reviews and look at all the designs that were actually made into product. Um, so that was like really eye-opening. Uh, I would, again, like open the boxes, get the sample room ready, um, file, do copies, like do all that kind of stuff. And then little by little, they sent me up a little station and I had a PC and they only worked in PC and Photoshop at the time, which I hated in, <laughs> in art school. I was like, I'm never going to do digital illustration. This is too hard. I don't know how a pen tool works. What is this magic? Um, <laughs> not for me. I'm going to be like a watercolor artist or something. I don't know. But it like really like baptism by fire, right? It just yeah. they threw me in there. Um, I think my first little design job besides like the grunt work was applying a pattern to a, a camo loaded. So it was just basically a rectangle. And then I did the design in the side. And then I had a couple other designs from other designers. And I had to wrap them and like show a front side and three quarter view. So the factory knew how to do it. So I was basically doing spec work for the designers. Again, another kind of like production kind of grunt work thing to do, but so important. Mm. Like it's so important to know all these little things that are in the process of, of developing products and manufacturing, yeah. right? Let me, let me interrupt you there because I just want to say spec work. There's two people, 
two, there's some confusing uh, terms of spec work. Spec work sometimes can be speculative work, which means that you're doing work not knowing if you're getting paid, but that's not what Amika is talking about. Spec right. work she's talking about is specification work, I guess would probably be the long word. And that's basically you're setting things up so that the manufacturer can know, okay, the candle is going to be, you know, six inches high and 20, whatever, two inches wide and have you know, whatever the patterns laid out as is. So that's the kind of spec yeah. work Amika's talking about. Sorry, just a little knowledge nugget in there. <laughs> so good, so good. It doesn't hurt to know more, right? Right. Um, yeah, so I was doing all that kind of spec work, putting dimensions on the artwork, um, doing different uh, views of the artwork, putting the palette, the PMS color chips, all the technical stuff that you need to know. Um, is the mug like what color is that mug there's so many blues and so many PMS color chips like all that specific data needed to be on um, digital copies and PDFs we'd have we send like hard copies too to the mm -hmm. factory so I would do all that work as well yeah so awesome. and, and so yeah for, trial by fire for sure you yeah. dug right in I love that yeah. I was there for about a year and then I finally was like officially like a at the end, I went from intern to like a junior designer and that just kind of set me off on my course to other design jobs. I love it. So then tell me like about your transition from in-house to freelance. Was it, you know, how did it happen? Was it planned or was it sort of like, oh, this, you know, just tell me how it went down. <laughs> so from 2009 to basically 2016, I was working in-house. I had about four different in-house design jobs. Um, between, between the second and third job, I tried to freelance and I, it just did not work out. It was like a summer of like random jobs like and trying to hustle and, and get into freelance, but I just did not have the chops. I did. I, I, I had some experience, but I didn't have like I didn't have my own style yet. So I couldn't like go into licensing or design studio. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know how to pitch myself. Um, so it was kind of like a, a, a first failure, I would say. And it was scary. Mm. And I knew that I just wasn't ready yet. So I got another job, like my third in-house design job. And then that place, I knew that, I knew the environment wasn't right for me. And so then I went into my fourth after about a year and I stayed there for about four years um but through all, all these design jobs that I've had um in the Minneapolis area I just had this whisper like is this it is this is this what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life am I gonna sit usually in a cubicle mm -hmm. um and just like crank out Santa after Santa and <laughs> um I don't know like the wheel was churning and there was always something in the back of my head. Like even after a year, I'd be like, okay, I've done everything in this job. Now it's like, okay, now we're going to jump back into spring design and then do spring, summer, yes, yes. Halloween, Christmas, and then do it all over again. It's like reinventing the wheel, right? Yes. Oh my goodness. So I, I feel that. I loved what I did. I love designing. I love art. Um, but I just knew the environment wasn't right. So I think I, I talked to uh, my friend's mom, who's a, who's a career coach. She like had coffee with me and she's like, you can always just try it again. You have more experience this time. You have, you know, you cut your teeth. You have a couple of clients out there that are wanting work from you, which I never had before. Um, she's like, you can always get a job. You don't have, you don't have trouble finding like design jobs, especially in Minneapolis you know, we have everything here, a lot of, a lot of great companies. And she's like, just try it, just try it. And so I started a side project with a company at my full-time job. It was a totally different category or whatever. And it was just like one little thing. And I just noticed like, okay, this is really, I can do this. And it, it's like the freelance started to like pile up more. And, and then, and then my full-time job was kind of suffering. And I'm like, okay, something's got to give here. Um, this isn't fair to the full-time job because someone could be in my place who really wants to be here and needs this job. Mm -hmm. And then I need to just like make that scary jump and just do it. So again, yeah. I had like one or two clients. I had not even a lot of savings. I had like a couple of months of expenses saved up, like not a lot. And my husband at the time was working a full-time job. He's a stay-at-home dad now, but 
I had that extra income coming in. Right. So yeah, I think something had to give. And that was finally the push in that, in the coach in my ear, like, just try it out, just do it. I was burnt out. I was extremely burnt out from traveling, um, from doing a lot of work. Um, I just like, didn't have a lot of boundaries either, um, at that time. So it, it just, it all came to a head and, and it happened. <laughs> That's and I'm well, happy. I mean, that's how it has kind of, you know, something's got to be a push, right? Whether it's, yeah. whether it's like, oh, you know, I mean, I've heard stories of people who lost their job and then they were like, well, this is a sign. Let's just try this. Or, or, right. you know, me, I was planning to move. So I was like, uh, I don't think there's right. really that many surface jobs in North Carolina. We're in Raleigh area. So let me right. just get freelance going and whatever yeah. it is, you kind of need that little like push you off the ledge yeah so. so that was like a spur of the moment like not spur but it was kind of just happened really fast but I knew from like years past looking back at my job and I was like I'm not super happy in this type of environment um so it was kind of like a slow roll and then bam it happened that's awesome yeah. um yeah I relate to that because you know I wasn't it's it's funny how when I look back at my time working in-house, I did enjoy it to some degree, but, and I don't think I really had those whispers like you're saying of like, oh, is this, is this really it? Like, what else could I be doing exactly? But I do remember just mornings of just being like, oh God, this is death. <laughs> And this is when I was working at jobs that I love, you know what I mean? Like working for baby gap was a great job, but as you say, there is this like, you know, repetition of like, after you have done all four seasons, then you start again with spring again. And it's like, yeah, okay. Well with, for baby gap, it's like, what are the, you know, the girls icons are going to be flowers and butterflies. The boys yeah. icons are going to be like, I don't know spring animals like frogs or something I don't even know whatever yeah, but yeah. it's always kind of formulaic right. and so yeah. that... I, I worked on amazing accounts like with Target I did a whole end cap for Father's Day like it didn't have my name or anything on it but like I worked with the team I worked with the buyer like amazing right like so super fun. cool stuff to do but it just it just I felt a little like is there anything more I can do. So then I started like traveling overseas. That was kind of new and fun. And then that kind of got old and, and, and tiresome and, and taking on more and then more meetings, more sales, more all this stuff. Like, sorry. And then I'm like, holy, I'm not like designing as much. And I'm just want to sit and design and do the fun work. And there's a lot of other things happening now. And I was like getting further away. Also, I saw like um, my boss and my boss's boss, like they just kept on taking more responsibility and, and that was like my future. And I was like, I don't see that in my future. Yeah. So that was a calling too. like, okay. That's, that is true. I, I thought about that too. It's like, as you get, if you're working in house, the career trajectory is like to be an art director, a creative director, a VP of design, whatever. And each step up, you're managing people and having the big ideas and doing less actual like drawing. So yeah, yes. that's definitely yes. and I um, a drawback paint. of if you, if you love the drawing, if you love the art, that, that can be a drawback right. of right to each their of own moving out. Each yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm a um, so, you know, I think that when you and I chat uh, on Instagram or wherever, we sort of have a uh, shorthand because we have both worked in-house and we have freelanced um, and you know like just now when I was like no she doesn't mean spec work like speculative she means spec work like specifications or whatever and you know so I, I feel like in this industry um, a lot of the more like vocal designers people who are really talking about about their work are often licensed really really heavy in the licensing game um, so having someone like you around who I can bounce freelance information off of and all that kind of stuff and know that sort of in-house background stuff, um, I've always loved that. Um, and I'm curious, like, in what ways has working in-house helped you when you went on your own? And are there any ways that it has maybe even like held you back in some ways once you went on your own? Yeah. Um, well, I, 
I'm so grateful for all my in-house jobs. Yes, I wasn't a hundred percent like myself, I would say, or a hundred percent happy in those jobs, but I've learned and gleaned so much from them. Like mm-hmm. I still use a lot of the tools I learned from in-house design today as a business owner and a creative entrepreneur. Um, time management, number one, mm-hmm. like having pockets or like, I still kind of work nine to five. I mean, I have a daughter who's four and um, she, you know, she has an early bedtime. She gets up seven, eight, so seven, eight, and then I get to work around nine and then I want to have dinner with my family. So it's kind of still that like nine to five esque timeline, which mm-hmm. I was used to doing every single day, Monday through Friday. Um, and I just work better in those hours myself. If I worked at night better, I probably would switch it around or figure something out, which we can do as freelancers, but that timing worked for me that helped um, workflow processes of like sketching to um, mood boards to trend to developing characters to developing palettes to using palettes like all of that was like all the team would do that together so that helped me like you know know what was next when it came to like designing especially with other freelance clients some other freelance clients work differently and I'm like okay well this is my process this is how I go off of so that was like um, a confidence in me that I had from so many years working in house, like this is how so-and-so does it. And this is, how, and then other, other clients would be like, oh, okay, well you just do your thing. And it just like helped as a guideline. Yeah. Being an in-house designer gave me principles and guidelines on being a freelancer. Mm-hmm. Um, it's basically the same. It's just in a different, in my house, in my studio. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And how to manage manufacture product, how to work with people overseas. Um, I went to factories that helped like knowing all the behind the scenes of what's happening when I work with a client, if they're not getting back to me or um, something dropped out of the sky or something or a project is totally wiped off the table. Like I understand it's not personal. It's just, there's so many things going on behind the scenes with a buyer with in-house teams, with their sales team, with the the art director, with with the creative director. There's just so many tiers and so much communication going on behind the scenes with different accounts. I know it's not personal when like things happen like really, really quickly taken away and put on my plate. Yeah. A hundred percent. That's definitely one of my biggest takeaways too, is, is having seen those meetings, having seen all that stuff that it's not personal and that, yeah, things just, you just kind of got to go with the flow and move with whatever's happening and, and not assume anything because it's, you know, there, I don't know what people who have never worked in house imagine an art director's job to be, but it's probably not what you're imagining. (laughs) I think it's like one or two people they're working with and there's like two checkpoints or something but there's yeah something. or just yeah just like a lot of um I don't know yeah so it's 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 just there's so many meetings and yeah checkpoints as you say and like presentations and and switching things around and like really yeah. just like having your hands and everything so um and then often it can be you know you can have multiple you know, an art director sometimes is doing other things as well of like managing in-house designers or doing other things. So it's just, yeah, um, there is so much on those art director's plates that it's, it's, you know, we have to re- be conscious of that and just know that like, if, yeah, if they dip for two weeks, it's just they're in meetings all weeks and, or they had a conference or whatever it is. So, and it's, it's okay. Yeah. And I think um, knowing that gives me the advantage to be like, okay, I haven't heard from them in a week, week or two. No one, no one's gonna push this. Like I'm kind of the outsider now, right? So no one's gonna push for me besides me. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna be forefront and just like email them and be like, hey, just checking in. Do you need anything? Did something mm-hmm. happen? Let me know. No pressure. Yeah. yeah. And that, and even those little check-in emails are like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. We totally. got so behind and then we got a, another project dropped out of the sky that we had to get done. And, and it's, it's like always something like that, that happens. And it's like, Oh, cool. No worries. Do you still want me to continue? Or do you want to pivot to something else? And just knowing I'm there to like help because they have so much on their plate coming in as a helper, like that's what they need, right? Mm-hmm. It's what they need, not what I need. It's like, what can I do to take more off of your plate? Cause I know it just keeps piling up. Exactly. 
Love that. That's such a good takeaway. Um, do you think there's anything that, you know, having worked in house sort of held you back in a way that like it kind of kept you had this in-house mindset that was difficult to break into freelance for whatever reason or no not so much kind of not so much that way I felt like I had more of an advantage but yeah. what did kind of was scary was the fear of not having a steady paycheck oh, in sure. benefits anymore mm-hmm. so that maybe held me back a little bit longer from actually jumping into freelance because it's like um I'm giving up this set number every two weeks and um my old company used to match my 401k like Mm. amazing that's like free money you know that's great um and I was just kind of gonna give all that away just for like the wild wild west (laughs) of freelance yes yes 100 percent I get paid all sorts of ways now like it's monthly or after 30 days after the project even started. Um, Sometimes I get it advanced. Sometimes I get royalties. Like there's no consistent pay. Mm -hmm. Um, So if anything, that was kind of like, well, I'm not getting that anymore. Yeah, seriously. And I mean, I, I don't know about you, but like, I can't predict my income at all. Like for years, it's like, you know, oh, I want to make this much, but you know, you go along through the months and you're like, let's say halfway through the year. And it's like, okay, well, I've made this much. Does that mean I'm going to make the same amount in the second half of the year? And that's what I'm going to make. No, I could make like so much more the next month or I can make nothing the next month. And it doesn't. So there's like, I never know, like, you know, especially when I was freelancing, I could never say like, if I was going to hit my financial goals until it was December. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Like, yeah. okay, I'm hoping to make 60,000. Okay. Well, I don't know. Let's I'll call you in December to tell you if that's yeah. going to happen or whatever. Yeah. My that accountant's like, day. do you think you're going to, you know, make more this year or the same? I'm like, uh, let's just be the same. Because yeah. <laughs> that's a hundred. Yeah. And, exactly. and if it's like, more really bonus, no clue. I hope I'm obviously hoping to make a little more each year, but Ooh, it was hard to, hard to figure out. It is. Um, and, yeah. So if you were doing it now with, with the experience, cause now I found that like, I thought it was going to be a pretty seamless jump because yeah, it is basically the same thing going freelance, but now we're yeah. doing different things, right? You, you know, right. we realize that it is more of its own business. Creative entrepreneurship is a phrase that you just used. And that is so true. Like we, lo- I think I wanted to think it was just this little like, oh, well, instead of designing yeah. for one company, I'm going to design for four companies and that's that. And it's no big deal. I'll just rotate through them, be good, you know, but obviously there's a lot more to it than that. So, you know, now knowing what you know, um, would you, how would you do, you know, would you make that transition different? Do you have any advice to anyone who's jumping into freelance after working in-house? Any, any advice to, to sort of like your former self? Um, no regrets. Yeah. Um, I make more money now than I ever did any in-house job. Whoop, whoop. Awesome. So that's Woo! amazing. Get it, girl. Get it. Um, but what I have to say is just like, really, yes, it probably would have helped to save a little bit more. Not like I really needed it, but that was just my journey. Like I just probably could have said, you know, three to six months is great. If you've had those expenses, you know, how much you spend a month, rent, mortgage, groceries, add that all up. So, you know, your bottom line of how to like keep the lifestyle you're living now, you got to make sure, you know, that number, you have to hit that number every month. Okay. And then you have that number plus three months in your savings account or more. It's not going to hurt. So yeah, I wish, maybe I wish I had more money, but it, I didn't, like I said, I didn't really need to tap into that. Um, and you never know workflow. Like you said, like you know, sometimes you need to dip in that to make you coast a couple weeks or whatever. You just don't know what's going to happen. So it's always good just to have a little buffer there. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Yeah. I have no regrets and, um, always just make sure like one thing is that like the energy that you're spending on say working this, a full-time job or you, you can like focus that energy on freelance. Once I realized like I'm working my butt off here in this full-time job, if I like really made this jump, all that energy I'm focusing here can go into freelance. And that once you focus, 
that like really set me off. So gotcha. Does that make sense? Like it just what you focus on will flourish, I think. So yeah. like don't be be scared and be nervous, but like it's gonna be okay because your time is gonna free up and mm-hmm. you can focus it on that. So yeah, yeah, right. I see what you're saying. So like when you're in a full-time job and then spending, you know, two hours every night after dinner trying yeah. to get something going, it's like, oh my God, I'm never gonna get there. But if you actually make that jump and you know, quit your job, then you have all that extra time, which I mean, granted comes with more pressure because it's like, okay, yeah, I got to make that money. But, um, but yes, you do have, as you, as you make the jump, you do have that time to, yeah. I was like, um, stealing from Paul to pay Peter or what, you know, like, I was just like, you know, I was just like, oh my God, once I finally made the jump and left my job and get my two weeks and I started like freelancing and I gave myself a week or two just to like decompress and be like, holy cow, that just happened. Okay. This is my new world. Then I was like, oh my gosh, I have full days. I have, you know, my morning time to actually like pitch to clients or look for potential clients. I don't have to like do it at night or on the weekend and be like super stressed out and like have all this pile on me. Like I can, yes, it's, it's a, it can transition into focusing more on the business. So that's my two cents. I love it. Um, so what are a couple things that you think uh, surface d- pattern designers or product designers should know besides obviously how to create the art? The art obviously is an important part, but there are some other things, um, you know, like trends or manufacturing information or communication. What kind of skills are needed for um you know, beyond the art for this business? Um, trends are great. That never hurts. Um, the more tools you have in your toolbox, the better, I say. Um, so yeah, trend work in knowing how to maybe do spec work, maybe know how to uh, communicate, make invoices. Uh, like, I didn't even know how to make an invoice when I first started. I'm like, does anyone have a, a template? And I've gone through like so many different styles because I was like, just trying to find one that worked for me because we're such a a niche you know it's like well I don't I don't need to look so businessy but I also want it to look like artistic but I don't want it to look like crazy (laughs) um but yeah like as a freelancer and as you know a licensing artist it's good to know and be on top of the trends which um and I luckily get a lot of trend from my freelance clients because they all all the product I work on is pretty trend driven it's like, okay, we want to do a Christmas theme with gnomes and buffalo plaid because that's what's trending right now. Okay, well, we're going to design a whole collection around that. So I need to know what a cute gnome looks like. And I mean, you could go on to Pinterest right now and type in gnome and you're going to see like a lot of gnomes. Mm-hmm. So keep that in mind. Like when trends are peaking, um, that means kind of everyone's doing it too. So you might even need to do like a one off of the trend. Is this gnome like a fairy? Is this gnome, I don't know, different wearing like a different pattern or I don't know. You just like, yeah, yeah. Adding a twist or mixing two trends together or like a trend and something that's like you, that's a standard, any kind of ways you can kind of add add a little twist to something is going to make it more interesting for sure. Yeah. Um, and like I said, just like knowing the process of how things are kind of behind the scenes, like asking your client, maybe how, how is this made or who do you use? Like, how is this printed and, and, um, how is sales going and just things like that, like to know more of the business side too, of where your art's going and like a, like a projection is always really good. Mm, Yeah. Um, so the other day we were on a call and you were talking yeah. about, um, you know, you made some really good points about how you price your work and about client budgets. And I wanted to chat about those points a little bit now um, and why they're so important. Um, do you happen to remember them? I remember them, but so I can prompt you. But do you remember some of the things that you told me that you always keep in mind when you're thinking about pricing? Yeah, what was the one? It was... Um... I always raise my rates yearly and I never assume what is in another person's wallet. 
Yes. So which one do you want to talk about first? <laughs> uh, let's start with the assuming about what's in someone's wallet. I love that one. Yeah. So I learned um, a few years ago, I can't remember where I got this information from, um, but it was just when you're in the negotiations part with a client, um, say it's new or you want things some, to change uh, pricing wise with a client that you already have, um, I just don't assume what their budget is because I know that I will pay, you know, I'll pay 10, 15 bucks for a mug, let's say, but someone else, they might pay 35, 50 for a mug that's beautiful and it has like a sentiment on it that really connects with them. Like all of our values are just different and how we see things is different, you know? And so when someone, when we're talking about budget and what they want to pay me or for the project, I say, okay, well, what's your budget? And then I close my mouth. I don't speak and I just wait. Um, and they'll usually tell me the budget and it could be like way more. It's usually way more than I would even pay myself or, and it's a happy surprise or it's very, very low. <laughs> and it's like, oh, okay. So I just don't assume. And I just put the ball in their court because usually when I put the ball in their court with their budget, it's, it's, it can be usually substantially higher and then I'll get paid higher and then they won't know what I was expecting. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's always a win. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, I definitely agree. I, I, in I, any way you can turn around and ask about the budget and also remembering that they're giving you, well, you know, it depends, but but often they're giving you the budget, but they might be giving you even the slightly lower end of the budget. So there's always a option to counter slightly higher if, um, you know, if you don't feel like it's enough um, or if right. you just want to go for it because, hey, why not? Why not ask? Right. Um, yeah. If you don't ask, the answer is always no. We know this one. So, um, you know, right. it's it's worth sort of asking, but, um, at least having that general idea of where their head is at, um, can be, can be a really helpful way to move forward, especially yeah. if it's a project. Like, I feel like, you know, sometimes new clients come to me with these projects and it's not just, so I, you know, this as a freelancer, it's like, it's never, I think also people think freelance, like product design and surface design is really just like the only thing that happens is someone emails and says, can you create a new print for me? like a new design, a new, a new pattern for me. Um, mm -hmm. and that's like, never it <laughs> like, or so rarely, you know what I mean? It's right. like, it's like, I need you to create this type of product with this type of art, but then change some of the icons and you're going to put it on this type of template and this type of art and like, whatever. So there's, there's always like moving parts. It's not just like a flat, like this is what you're going to get a pattern with five colors or whatever. It's always kind of moving parts. So no, yes. so it's not as cut and dry of like, okay, well, that's clearly going to be X amount of dollars. It's, it's mm -hmm. like, well, there's a lot of happening. So let me see yeah. what you usually like, pay. Cause you have been, you know, yeah, doing this more. It's like a menu. It's like in my, um, you have an awesome resource, the, the client brief. Oh yeah. 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 I love that. Um, it's like, when someone approaches me, it's like, what do they need? Do they have a palette picked out already? Okay, I don't need to do that. Um, send me the palette. Um, do you know what characters do you want? Okay, you want a Santa and a snowman? Great, I can do those. Do you want to see sketches first or do you want to just see straight color? Um, do you have a theme picked out? Do you, can we use metallics? Can we use foil? Can we use embroidery? What product is this on? It's just, it's, it's literally like a laundry list and checking it and then like, me thinking of a quote inside my head of like, okay, this is going to take me this long. Um, and then the, I, I just love like having, like I said, the ball in their court of a number, and then we can just kind of tweak it and go off of that number. Cause we know how long it's going to take. Maybe they don't. It, it's just yeah. like a good starting point. Yeah, totally. I will put the link to that, um, client brief blog in, in the description. So I use it all the like time. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a good one. Just kind of like all the things you need to make sure, you know, before you dig into a client brief. Um, all right. Now let's talk about the second one of raising your prices every year. Hello. I love this. Of course. I'm always saying this as well. Um, 
I feel like I'm good at uh, raising my prices with new clients. As I get new clients, I ask a little bit more, um, but I could be better at raising my prices with my existing clients. I definitely could be. Um, I do raise them, but some I'm better at doing that than others. Um, yeah. talk, to, talk to me a little bit about that and how, how you go about doing that. Um, so right around the end of the year, before January, I try to doctor up an email saying, um, and just giving like valid points, like, you know, inflation happens every year. Um, expenses go up every year for everyone. Um, groceries have gone up, gas has gone up. I know it's um, I don't list all this stuff, but just yeah. due to like business expenses, um, I am gonna charge this amount now. And yes, you have to be a concerned or you have to be worry, wary that yes, the client could say no. That is a risk that they can't afford it. Um, I try to do increments of you can go as low as five bucks extra for your hourly mm -hmm. every year just raise it five dollars every year mm -hmm. um you can go more it just depends um that's what i try to do i try to send out one email it's like it's boundaries it's, it's my business um i know that the companies i work with they're sales driven and their goal is to always push more sales and to grow I want to grow too. And if they're growing, I should be growing, right? Like, yeah, no, for sure. Their so, goals, my goals are really similar. It's you want to grow and make more money. So if you have more money and you're bringing in more money because my art is on your product and it's selling, you should be able to pay me more. A hundred percent. Definitely. Um, yeah. I like, I like that kind of taking that approach of literally like every year you know at the year end saying like well this is it's just it's just you know there's this detachment to it it's not like I've been thinking about this and you specifically should be charged more or whatever no it's like it's like my rates are going up here's the situation yeah um, my accountant does it to me every every year yeah you know, she, exactly they have programs that go up their you know software goes up our software adobe software um, I'm having a kid in August, so my expenses are going to be going up. Uh, you know, just think life, life happens. Yeah. Um, we can't be stagnant. That's not a good business model to be sure stagnant. Isn't. So, and it works for like, that works for hourly. Now, if you're not charging hourly, if you have project fees, do you bother to say anything or do you just start to, like, you know, a similar project, you charge more, like an extra hundred dollars the next time or something. How, how do you ever go about that? I usually kind of just edge it up um, unless it's like really, because like I said, it does tend to be all these different things. So you kind of never know what the, the thing is. If I, if I'm with a client that's like, we always do the exact same thing and it's always the exact same price, I probably have to address it. But if it's something that kind of varies anyways, then I just start bumping it up. But what about you? Um, I had a client, just for an example, I was um, charging hourly um, and I realized I was getting faster and better and I could keep hitting the mark of what their brief needed and all of, all of my art was basically selling in and doing really well with them. So they kept coming back to me. So there, the, you see the scale starts to kind of like tip like, okay, this is going really well. And yes, you don't want to rock the boat, but also you don't want to be um not compensated yeah. right and right. if anyone is like me or you know a, a lot of artists we're always taking skillshare classes or learning more about the industry or getting better at our skills every every year just by doing what we're doing so we're always upping the ante so I was like okay I'm gonna have just a conversation with this client and see what they say and just feel it out and I said um <clears throat> I would like to move from hourly pricing to project-based pricing. What do you think about that? And I had like the best answer ever because she's like, oh yeah, some of my other freelancers do that too. Um, let me show you a template of how to do it. And she kind of showed me and I was like, this is amazing. So basically now I give her, she sends me the brief and then I give, I assess it with my laundry list of, you know, what can I do? What do I need to do? think in my head, give a little buffer. Um, it's kind of like hourly 
and I just kind of add it up in my head with the little buffer and then I'll send a quote to her Mm -hmm. and the quote is usually higher than what I was getting paid but I should be getting paid a little bit more because again my experience is is further along my skills are faster Um, I know how to like hit their mark Um, I'm an expert in my field so I should be getting paid like that so that's Mm -hmm. one way to transition Um, and I think every designer artist hits that wall of hourly like okay like and sometimes even project-based is is better because I know okay so like if something takes me five hours and it usually takes me five hours to do it okay that's five hours I'm gonna get paid that but next time I do it it could take me four hours I'm still getting paid for that and the next time it's gonna take me three and then two and I'm spending this like two hours time and getting paid five hours for it. Well, I could be doing more work and keep piling it on, or I can start charging a little bit more and keep my work steady. What do I want to do if I don't want to burn out? Right. These are the things we got to think about. Right. Yeah. I know. I know. Well, yeah, hourly certainly gets, you know, generally gets a bad rap and, and that's why, because the more efficient you are, you obviously are, would be making less. Um, but I do still do it. And, and I just try to raise my rates and, and try to, to keep it, but, but I like, you know, I prefer project-based pricing, but I kind of let the client take the lead because sometimes it is a matter of you're doing all these different types of things on now take this and put this totally. here, and then you're going to mix it with this and all that. And totally. so it's not as cut and dry. And so sometimes I'm like, okay, well, let's just, and that also prevents me from having to say, I'm only going to have like two revisions or something. It's like, you can have as many revisions as you want. It's just getting charged hourly. So if you want me to mess around with this one flower 14 times that's your business you know luckily I don't have too many clients like that but you know what I mean so and um, some clients I have different products I need to design there's different categories so some I pay hourly for some I charge hourly for and some is it's a flat fee for the type it's just it's all around like you're right it's like we kind of let the client lead you assess it and if you feel like you can get more value, if they're getting a lot of value out of your work, I think that's when it's a time to like, just have a conversation about it. And there's nothing wrong having a, a conversation about anything in my, in my opinion. Yeah, totally. Um, let's talk. I think we have a little time to do this before I have a new segment, by the way, that's coming at the end of this. I'm debuting it with you, Amiko. So thank you for being my, my test subject. I think this is going to be fun, but first let's get to one last question about um surface pattern design crews um you know community is such a huge thing i mean i I could talk about it all day long um what you know i've noticed lately um i'm in the art brand alliance as well as you and you are very active in that community which i love you're on different committees and you're always kind of doing things for that so that's super awesome and I also know that you, you know, meet regularly with, with some other artists, friends of, you know, that I know is like, oh, I saw Miko yesterday, whatever. So um, I know that you are very active in sort of the designer community. Um, has that, you know, ha- can you relate that to like your growth in any way? Has that, or is it just like a purely social or, you know, tell me, tell me what that community does for you. Oh my gosh. I think that's really like, really set off my uh, brand part of my business. Um, when I, I reached out to Betsy, she's the, the owner of the Art Brand Alliance. Like it was first kind of like a coaching call with her. Cause, and then, and then she recommended the Alliance to me after when you're a freelancer, you just feel like you're kind of an Island. And we have a really robust design community here in Minneapolis, but with COVID happening, like I couldn't get out and see people. I couldn't even see old coworkers face-to-face really, except through Zoom. I don't know. I just like, I felt really out of touch. And once I joined the Alliance, um, was it two years ago? And then I started like comparing and like being exposed to other creative entrepreneurs on totally different journeys or, or similar, that was like enlightening to me. I was like, oh my gosh, they do it this way. I could do it that way. They've kind of paved the way. Do I want to do that? Do I want to go down a children's book 
road? Do I want to go down a brick and mortar shop? Do I want to do an online shop? Um, just like having a community to reach out to and just like see of how other creative entrepreneurs maneuver this crazy roller coaster lifestyle that we live, yes. like it was just so cool. And I don't know, like everyone needs peers and everyone needs someone that's maybe like them or, you know, and further down the road. So that like, you can see the goal, um, a little bit clearer. If that makes sense. Like I saw yeah. other artists that were doing children's books and having an online shop and doing freelance and doing illustration work and doing licensing. And I was like, Oh yeah, if they can do it, I can do it. Cause we're all kind of just human, it, human, the humanity came out. Um, and everyone was so open and communicative. Like if I ever had any question, it, you know, the art brand Alliance really could help. And I met like a really, uh, I got closer within the community too and like could reach out and dm and and then start actually having like really fun close relationships with other women artists too that we talk almost every day now so it it, it just like made my brand flourish and, and we have again like such a neat niche niche thing it's like we have these like really specific questions and when i had them i finally had someone to talk to about it that was like amazing so that. yeah yeah community like in my when I was creating start your surface pattern business um two years ago three years ago two and a half years ago I was like okay what are the things that have led to my success what are the like bare minimum things that you need and that's what I base my modules on of course um and so I have a whole module based on community and like talking Aww. about like anecdotes about how community has helped me um including being able to like bounce things off of you. Like I, you know, at one point, a couple of years ago, I was like thinking for freelance that I had to kind of hit a wall with like how much hourly I could charge. And so I was like, so I'm charging this much. How, yeah. how are you, where are you at? And you were like, oh girl, I, we can do more. We can do better than that. So I was like, yes. All right. See, so now I know. Right. So, um, yeah. Yeah, but I have all kinds of anecdotes about, about how community has helped me in, in the course and then suggestions on how people can, you know, make make some friends yeah, um, it gives you confidence because I never really thought like my friend our friend Nicole Tamron she always is like you're a unicorn Amiko like there's not a lot of people like you that can like do a bunch of styles but also like have their own thing on the side like that's a really good thing to have and I'm like but we do it every day so we're not really like oh it's just true. like what we do and then just to have someone like I can help people with freelance or you know brand work or you know whatever um, and then I kind of like found my value too, like, oh, I actually do have a lot to say and I have a lot of experience. So just that like back and forth was like so refreshing to have and confident building. I love it. Now for my new segment. <laughs> I, I think I need a, a, I might need a better title or some sort of flash title screen. I might have to edit that in, but, um, uh, my new segment that I'm super excited about, uh, right now, I'm just going to call it hot topics. I don't know, but, um, what I have is a long list of things that we get advice about in this industry, conflicting advice. I am going to kind of pepper this in with some of my interviews and you are like I said my first uh my first interviewee to do this um and we're going to talk about three things hopefully if we have time for three things that yeah. um you know we get conflicting advice about and there is no right answer here's a spoiler alert there's no real right answer um but I just wanted to kind of you know touch base and we say what we think you know which side we lean towards on this this advice mm -hmm. so the first thing that I, um, you know, people get conflicting advice about is one, you should pitch to your, pitch your work to new clients with a brand book versus you should pitch your work to clients with a few JPEGs attached to an email. Mm -hmm. So like a brand book being just in case that, you know, um, is, you know, maybe a six or seven page like PDF or something that has like all kinds of mock-ups and shows your full kind of collections and maybe has a little bit of story behind it and, and talks about where you came from. And so it's really like an in-depth look at what you do and your art. 
um, versus a few JPEGs being, you know, a couple images, maybe they have a mock-up on it, but you know, it's a lot more about the artwork and um, just kind of shows like some quick, like highlights of what you do. Um, what do you think about that? I've never done a brand book, but it sounds super interesting and fun um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and polished. Yeah, um, yeah. I think I'm in the middle. I've sent I've sent like a one to two page PDF of like an artist statement and an introduction and a photo of me and my background and my brand and my like statement of like what I believe in and what I'm trying to achieve um, as a Miko Marimbo brand. And then, um, and then I'll have like examples of my work on another page. And I, I've given my age of that. And um, I'm actually working on some mock-ups too. Mock-ups never hurt, I don't think. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's again, just more tools in the toolbox. Like the more you know and the more knowledge you have, the better. So yeah, I think I'm in the middle. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah, I think I, I've only, I created a brand book because my agent um, wanted me to, wanted everyone to. And I they started like kind of asking their artists to do that after I had signed on. So I think that people who had, who signed on with Jewel Branding after me had like a requirement to like, as part of onboarding kind of to, to, to create a brand book, but I never had that requirement at first. So I kind of was late to the game and finally was like, oh, I guess if everyone's doing this, I should do this. Um, so now I do have a brand book, but literally, I mean, I did it only a couple of years ago and they have it on their website so that people can get an idea, but I don't really, um, I have never like tried to pitch like my freelance work or anything like that with something so uh, detailed. Um, and I don't pitch myself for licensing. So, I mean, it might be different if you are, if you are pitching your own licensing work, you know, obviously my agent is doing that. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm on in camp uh, a few JPEGs to kind of give the highlights, but then you can always give a link to your website. Well, you should give a link to your website or potentially um, suggest that you're, you know, you could put together a larger PDF of images that would be perfect for that company. Um, you know, so you're, you're giving them more opportunity to engage with your artwork, but, but just kind of, you know, having that kind of like appetizer in the email um, mm -hmm. is, is the route that I usually go. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I can cut it. Yeah. Oh, perfect. <laughs> All right. I know I want, I want us to have like paddles of like, yeah, like yeah. I, yes, whatever. Yeah. I had, I had an idea that this was going to be like, originally it was going to, I wanted to have like a panel and just have go through all of them. But then I was like, that's too much organizing for some random thing. So let me just add it into my interviews here and there. This so <laughs> yeah. And by the way, in the description, I will put a link to my brand book because it is online. So if anyone's curious, they can check it out. It's, it's, you know, whatever, just interesting, I guess. Um, so next thing that people get conflicting advice, um, you need to use Adobe Photoshop or Illustrator in this industry, or they've also heard the advice that you can use Procreate and Affinity, which is another um, vector program, sort of like, mm -hmm. like Illustrator, I guess. Um, you have to use Adobe products or you can use Procreate and Affinity and whatever. Um, what's your thoughts on that, Amiko? I don't even know what affinity is. To <laughs> yeah, I barely do. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, okay. So I don't think you need to do anything. Um, it's just kind of what your preference is. Um, I personally use Adobe and Photoshop because that's what my jobs in-house required. And I use Procreate for my art as well. But um I just think, and again, knowledge is power. More tools in your toolbox is power. Um, yeah. Like if you're a hairstylist and you can only use scissors, you're only going to get a, a little bit of what you can do, right? But if you can use a curling iron and a flat iron and perm. I love, I love a good analogy. All right. <laughs> if you can highlight, I mean, you're just a more robust, confident brand. And you're just yeah. like a person, like a professional. Yeah. Totally. So if you if you don't have time i get it and you if you want to stay in a lane of like being an analog painter or a digital paint you know you know do what you love to do because it's gonna make you have more longevity as as a designer or artist because you love to do that but like it, if you have time to learn photoshop or illustrator go for it if you have time to learn affinity or procreate try it it's not gonna hurt 
yeah it's whatever your energy how much again it's like your energy like I I get bored kind of easy so you know I, I traditionally learned how to paint and draw you know traditionally and then I learned digital um, Photoshop and Illustrator and then now that's kind of made me go into Procreate which I love which is a mix of everything mm. so that works for me um but yeah if, if you go ahead learn all the things if you have the time and energy for it nice it's not hurt you. yeah I would say that yeah you make some great points uh, for sure it's like whatever definitely more tools in your toolbox is great I would say, you know, for, I feel like for licensing, you can kind of whatever, as long as you can export to some sort of file format that everyone can use, you're good. Um, I feel like for freelancing, you would be, you would have a hard time if you were just Procreate and Affinity. I don't even know Affinity that well either, but like, even if you were just Procreate, I, you know, I feel like it would be tricky, but it depends on yeah. what your freelancing is. Are you creating um, pattern? You know, are you doing patterns? It just depends on what your, your job is. So um, that depends basically, um, which yeah. again, all of these depend in some way. So I would say, uh, I would say, yeah, not to sweat, sweat it too hard, but if you want to be really like able to move in all circles, then you're probably going to have to learn some. Yeah. Uh, it's what's, uh, what, what is what are you trying to execute what is the client yeah. need what are the needs and what are you trying to uh, basically execute in the end you know so like if you need a sticker you can paint it and then yeah maybe someone on their team has a production person and they can make a, the die line and spec it out for you it yeah it just depends yeah. these are tough i know i know I well that's why it's more just a, it's fully opinion fully subjective yeah. um all right last one and then we will wrap up all right. So the third conflicting uh, advice that is out there is that you should present your work on your website in collections mm -hmm. versus you should present your work on your website by category. For example, florals in one place, geometrics in another place, you know, whatever, by category. Um, I don't have a strong thought on that either. <laughs> I think, I mean, you know, I do work in collections. Um, and what I do is I present on my website, I have things in categories, but it's not categories like floral geometrics. It's like patterns, yeah. illustrations, how like greetings. So more like green cards and like holidays. So it's kind of like, we it's weird categories, <laughs> but um, so I show, I show like the collections a I really show like more single images than full collections, mostly just my favorite from a collection, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but I can see why collections would look pretty too. What about you, Amiko? Um, I do a fusion. That's just like the whole like theme of my life is just a mix of everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I do, when you go to my, um, like my portfolio, my licensing portfolio, it's adult or kids. Right. But, you know, some kid stuff is an adult, some adult is in kids, even because I have such colorful artwork and it's, you know, quotes and diversity and inclusivity. So that's kind of for both. And like, who buys for kids? The parents. So that's technically adult too, in a sense. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I have adult and kids when you go in and then you can click on both. And then in each theme is in each category is a theme like Christmas kids, you know, uh, diversity kids, animals, and it goes like that. And then it's kind of the same. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I figure as long as it's clear, right. As long as people understand what they're looking at and it's not just like, wait, I don't even know what's happening here. It doesn't have to be like, you know, super rigid. There's no right way. Just, it just needs to be easy to navigate. So I think a good art director can look at anything and figure it out yeah you know what I mean like and if someone um if, if someone's professional and knows what they're doing they can see your art any kind of which way and figure out how they need it to fit their brief or needs that's true that's right? true so but like, anyway you can make it easier for them I think that's uh, yes that's... <laughs> make it easy, clean but yeah but also yeah. like they're professional too and, and and they 
kind of know what they need. So don't like focus too much time. Yeah, on yeah, it. yeah. Don't get don't caught get up too, on it for sure. Don't get too fussy with like a bunch of words and stuff. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Make yeah. the art number one for sure. Um, yeah. Well, thank you for uh, all those opinions in the new Hot Topics segment. I appreciate it. And thank you so much. This has been so much fun. I am going to put your links in the... Um, in the description. So we'll have your like Instagram, your website, and Amiko has an awesome shop with prints and all kinds of other cool stuff that you should definitely check out. Um, some really beautiful, colorful, yeah, diverse inclusivity work. And it's just uh, so beautiful. So I'm so happy to have been able to connect with you. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. I so appreciate you asking me to do this. And this is so fun. It's fun to talk shop with you. I know. I love it. All right. Have a good one. In the description of all my YouTube videos, I have a link to elizabethsilver.com slash fresh, which will take you to sign up for my Surface Pattern Boss Toolkit. Once you sign up, you'll get an email to confirm, and then you'll get the password to get into this toolkit where you can find all kinds of resources, Surface Pattern job guide, business advice, all kinds of trend reports, plus bonus videos, and access to the archives for my newsletters where I have all kinds of cool links and useful creative business advice that you can check out. So I hope you go down to the link and join me. I'd love to have you. And while you're at it, hit subscribe and check out more videos on my channel.